thank you all very, very much for coming to this um, generative citizen, <laughs> which was kind of idea that um, I've been sort of, you know, brewing along and developing. And um, so this is my first opportunity to present some of the ideas that I've had. And, um, and I hope that you like it. And I hope there'll be time for questions and your comments and input as well. I mean, I know the my proposal said um, com a conversation, but this is probably more like a presentation, but I but I hope that um, I'll, I'll, I'll try and sort of do it so that we've got time to talk to each other as well. Um, as obviously it's a generative field and I really, you know, really want to be, um, you know, inspired and engaged um, together by this topic. I want to just sort of thank Robbie who's here and Julian and Muriel who are part of the UK generative change team. And of course, I want to thank uh, Robert and Sorry, Steve. Sorry, I'm making a salad. <laughs> without whom there would not be a field. And I also want to thank um, Patricia Novick, who's with us, and also our colleague and very dear friend, Judith Delosia. And I would say these are the people that have been, you know, supports and inspirations, and particularly, you know, Patty and Judy. This is an ongoing research study book group conversation life that you know we're sharing on this topic and it's incredibly vital and important to to the three of us particularly so um this really was you know i first mentioned this at, at a wonderful dinner that robbie hosted i have to say <laughs> up in primrose hill and uh you know he was there and i was there and julian and robert and steve and i said you know what about um a stream in uh generative change that is called generative citizen that would just be for us as humans to develop and evolve in the world that we're in, you know, as I said in my piece that you've read, you know, world of climate breakdown and the pandemic and the rise of fascism and racism and social injustice, and that it would be like this kind of, um, you know, social contribution aspect, but also to integrate some of that in inside of these amazing, amazing skills and principles and practices that we are working with in, in the generative change field. And um, so, um, so this is what I've got. I've got this idea that there are five, you know, five practices. So in other words, everything is embodied, everything comes in and is metabolized in the body. It's an integrated, you know, embodied and embedded uh, kind of, set of relationships between some of the skills and tools that we that we actually have and um, and and bringing kind of politics and historical knowledge uh, uh, and things like that into into our practice so let me share my slides I have got slightly more slides than I had thought that I would but I hope that there I hope that you'll enjoy them um, <clears throat> oh, so um, so this was the idea, you know, of a generative citizen that we would more consciously bring the healing and the creative skills and tools and principles of generative change into the field of everyday life with a shared vision for a more socially just and healthy and happy world. So that's really my, where I'm coming from. And then these next three slides are how I have begun every single conference I've been invited to, which has been a lot. As my hair has grown grayer and longer, <laughs> these slides have sort of slightly shifted and been edited and evolved, but they've, you know, they're part of the year that I've had which is this idea of leadership in the community using, and this is from the NLP side, but we could say in the generative change side, 
for social change, social justice, the well-being and health of people and the planet, seeking the opportunities in the crisis, all the things we're talking about in the conference, uh, creating a livable human future, a kind of hero's journey for everyone, uh, and leading with our creativity, leading with our flexibility, and working together in a field for the common good. I think in terms of the pandemic, we're looking at grieving, you know, healing our hearts and our spirits, uh, rebuilding, restoring some of the critical losses. And as Robert and Steve have been saying, and all the other wonderful presenters and all the other wonderful participants on the conference, that we're all in a field of reimagining the future, seeing and sensing what's going to be possible now, creating new, new projects and tools. <laughs> and so here is the generative citizen sort of idea, as I called it as a joke, you know, the civilian wing of generative change. I was saying to Patty the other day, instead of going to the barricades, we're going to the resources and obstacles, <laughs> in a la French Revolution. So this is like a provisional name. I'm not tied to this. None of this is set in stone. This is just kind of first pass ideas. So it's not necessarily like one of the professional roles that we've got, which is like a therapist or a cult consultant or a coach or a leader. You know, there's lots of these identity, you know, that, that people are taking these tools through certain kinds of professional identities. I'm thinking, you know, any and more and none, you know, just like being a person, but it would be a dedicated developmental path and program. And the idea would be it's kind of soft and generous and open, uh, kind of in an informed and skillful presence across many, many informal, everyday informal chit chat, neighbors, friends, family, you know, occasions. Um, and it would be embodying these resources and potential for that we're learning and we're developing and we're on that never ending path of developing connection, empathy, creative renewal in personal and public life. Um, and what I want for us as a field is to have a bigger influence as a field across a range of projects that are gonna be vital for our human future. So I think, you know, we've got the technology and the, and the practices, the embodied practices and principles that we all really need right now. Um, and I want to also evolve our field to be genuinely inclusive and diverse and genuinely connect and learn from many different communities, especially more marginalized communities. Um, you know, where I'm coming from, uh, is, you know, I come from a racially mixed family background. I live in a very diverse borough, in the most diverse borough in London. Um, my work has always been, uh, uh, you know, around, you know, inclusivity, diversity, uh, anti-racist, um, feminist. So those are kind of my politics also kind of coming through here. Um, and I would like us to find a way, if there is a way, of us kind of bringing a kind of sensibility, an informed sensibility around some of those issues through ourselves in these kind of soft ways into the world as part of our work. So these are questions and beginnings and suggestions that, as I say there, it's open. And here are the five practices. So there are five practices working together. And so in, in other words, they're all kind of things that you do sort of every day, <laughs> you know, or every, you know, every few days you're working to develop your practice and your understanding um, of these things. So the first one is Coach Crash. Then there's something on identity and sponsorship and awakening and kind of healing. Uh, there's something on empathy and second position, stepping into other people's shoes. There's something a lot on communication and 
particularly this idea of kind of fake news and how we're all in different worlds and it's very hard to relate to and talk to each other across a kind of you know chasms of misunderstandings and kind of false false you know frames and so-called facts and then there's what I'm calling for now a kind of citizen's knowledge base to which I would hope everyone would contribute and we would as a field sort of make certain kinds of decisions about what we feel is uh, are good things to include um so those are the five practices so the first one coach crash which um we all know of course i just want to add that in this last year the coach crash model has been essential and indispensable to me i have learned so much through a really deep engagement with this coach crash practice over this last year bringing you know crash as a source of information holding difficult feelings in coach you know yeah it's not always comfortable and wonderful but that that's the home for all our upset and anger and despair and frustration and fear that people have experienced i have experienced through this year um, to br have this place to hold it and what i'm calling metabolize like your whole body and your whole system metabolizes everything that that gives us life and allows us to thrive and, and grow as humans, a kind of metabolizing experience and coaches and crash is this essential source of information, you know, but also in my view, we need a kind of informed coach state. I think you can you can be in a coach state and literally know you know, hardly anything about racism or social injustice or misogyny or all of those things. I know Steve has been talking about this a lot and Robert too on this, um, on this conference. And I agree, I think racism is just in that, it's in the field. You can't, you know, that's how we're created. All of that has gone into our bodies racism and misogyny is kind of part of us and then it's about how conscious can we be and what can we kind of metabolize and change and transform somehow into kind of energy to bring peacefulness and wholeness um, to ourselves and each other i also wanted to add into the coach coach crash practice something that's been very important to me which i also think would be part of this developmental pathway which is to do more physically to have more distinctions in the physical kind of somatic range and i know that i did something you know at the first um generative coaching generative change conference um in uh, santa cruz i can't remember how many years ago four years ago or whatever i did a session on alexander technique so i'm just reminding and mentioning it here because it's a process it's i've been going to lessons for really 40 years regular lessons to give me just more and more distinctions in my body so i know more and more when i'm going into crash and more and more when i'm actually really in coach you know along that kind of continuum and so i thought i'd just mention something about you know alexander technique which is just so lovely to give yourself the gift of really bringing more wisdom and knowledge into your body about how your body is coding coach and crash and so he was a modeler he modeled himself the use of the self it's called to be graceful poised you learn, you learn through touch um and basically it's wonderful practice and discipline awareness of your habits as you tighten you know that's that neuromuscular lock that robert and steve talk about that you start to tighten up and then those falters kind of get rigidified um and it, and it has this stopping and pausing built into it where you breathe and uh, pause and slow down. And, um, and so there's this idea that you also in your body can get faulty perception, this kind of fake news that we have in our minds and bodies 
that run interferences into our relationships with ourselves and with others. And so there's this idea in Alexander, the, you know, that you've got the head neck as the primary control, this particular joint, and that you've got this kind of, um, you know, uh, you know, relationship with gravity that is kind of upwards and downwards. And um, here is a nice photo of somebody in perfect graceful poise, utterly graceful and balanced. You know, that's what you would see in these kind of supreme athletes, that Serena Williams. Um, so that's my first point, which is coach crash, to really deepen your practice all the time, however you can, and to welcome everything that crushes you, because this is how we're going to grow. This is going to be the richness that we grow, how we grow ourselves and develop ourselves. Um, then the next one is I have put identity awakening, and it's obviously using the beautiful logical levels model. Again, this model has given, you know, given so much to me. Um, I think, uh, so this idea of the development of identity to do the work, I mean, from NLP or from generative trance or generative coaching that is more developmental and healing. An example of that would be re-imprinting. Um, I think especially in this work where you start to be in more political circles, it's, uh, and talking about, you know, like racism or, or, or sexism and misogyny and how it's affected all of us. Um, there, are, there, are there are places we can go which are really crash. I think one of them is an idealized self where we become holier than thou, you know, we become the righteous, the righteous people who have the truth. And that actually is a crash state, interestingly. Or we become, you know, guilty, ashamed, um, you know, uh, inadequate, whatever. So I think these sorts of issues can be a part of this ongoing practice to heal this kind of generational wounds, you know, to come more fully as ourselves into the world, to be able to hold and flow with these beautiful positive archetypal energies, to be mindful of the shadows, uh, and, and, and to be doing this work from inside this dynamic coach state, um, which is, yes, which as I say, every letter, those 10 letters of coach and crash have just means so much. Each one um, is, is a world of its own, of um, practice and experience. And so, for example, in the logical levels, at behavior level example, I really loved what Robbie said uh, yesterday about when you don't know something, go and learn it, you know, go put yourself on a program to learn it. It was very good. So these are sort of, then you could go and learn. You could do like a microaggression awareness program or you know um all kind you you can do all kinds of things so um so i just like these two quotes this is from karen barrett who who is a physicist at the university of santa cruz and um she just says existence isn't an individual affair you know so when we're talking about identity we're also talking about the field we're also talking about us and we and our mutual influence with each other. Individuals do not pre-exist their interactions. Individuals emerge through. We become ourselves through and as part of what she calls our entangled <laughs> intra-relating, <laughs> which may not be easy to translate. I'm sorry about that, but it's, it's a great phrase in English anyway. And then there's a lovely quote I've got from Pema Chodron, again on identity. We're not as solid as we think. You know, in truth, there's enormous space in which to live our everyday lives. We see that the sense of a separate, isolated self and a separate, isolated other, that's the crash, isn't it? Is a painful misunderstanding that we could see through and let go. Um, and then, of course, we've got Robert's amazing, I, I love this list, 
uh, on identity development, um, finding and clarifying life's direction, you know, managing boundaries between self and others, becoming clear about beliefs that support our identity and those that limit us, kind of an expansion of our sense of self, incorporating new dimensions of being and becoming more and more present in who, in who we are. And I've got some nice, um, I just put like a couple of paintings. I love this painter who's um, African-American painter, Amy Sherald. And uh, these paintings, aren't they great? I mean, you see these people, don't you? Identity, you see people, you see their, you see them in their portraits. Something has really been seen about who these people are. And that's, I think, that whole kind of sponsorship aspect of identity as well that we work with. So they're called Pictures of American Life. And then I'll do this one and then maybe we'll have a, well, let's see. Is everyone still all right? Are you all right to be, nod if you're, <laughs> wave at me if you I can only see about three people okay so this I think is a real big one and um empathy and it's something I know that all of us here are you know are constantly have a practice stepping into other people's perspectives and experiences stepping into their cultural history stepping into different worlds but I think it's a really urgent practice now to go further afield in your sensibility about who you will identify with and who you will find out about. Um, and so of course we've got the perceptual positions model. You can go to second position with multiple people. Uh, we used to run for many, many years in my um, NLP Institute this wonderful game, it's in the NLP encyclopedia, the United Nations cultures game, which is absolutely brilliant that you, you know, you try on through meta programs, these four different cultures and you give people a chance to kind of really inhabit them and people make outfits and, you know, uh, all kinds of things. And then there's this amazing meeting where they have to work with each other and work across wholly different kinds of metaprogram clusters. You know, like one group is a matriarchy, you know, who only wants relationship. Another group is kind of like, um, you know, very individualistic, you know, very sort of money oriented, you know, very, very wonderful game. These kinds of things, I think, what can we do to like expand our, our um, circle of compassion, as Einstein said, and I particularly, because I have an arts background, I think a lot of people know, you know, I worked in the theater for a while. I think we should like really be using more, you know, in, uh, playback theater and improvisation and reading together and, you know, finding novels by people from all over the world and reading them together and talking about them and stepping into those worlds more and more and more to kind of expand our sense of who's in the world. Also music and dance and painting and sculpture and movies and video, like really making it a practice to go outside of what we currently might be even interested in to go, what don't I know? Who don't I know about? What perspectives have I never taken? And, and bringing that again in through the body um, in whatever way we can. I also wanted to mention for this, and I know you might think this is a sort of rather odd thing, but um, when Black Lives Matter started, and I, I was on Twitter, I started following literally oh, I don't know, 200 or more um, accounts from um, Black Americans kind of who were talking about writing articles about, you know, scholarship, art, conversation, memes, you know, everything. And I can honestly say, I mean, and, and I didn't ever post anything on it. Sometimes I retweeted people. Um, but really, I, I, you know, I just learned such a lot. I just put myself into that, into that field and just tried to learn such a lot. And it's such an amazing opportunity 
we've never had this opportunity before really to step into other people's conversations and their own intra-group conversations with each other about what's going on and it's like a window into worlds that that is available to all of us you can do that with anything that you are interested in and then I wanted to mention compassion practices which those of you I know there's quite a lot of people who are more Buddhist practicing there's a couple I wanted to mention uh, one which I find really supports me a lot actually is if I feel um, you know when I'm taking my crash into a coach there's a really nice frame of just remembering that other people all over the world are feeling exactly like you they're feeling exactly like me so I'm feeling despair or I'm feeling upset or you know alone and I can somehow connect I can hold this in coach and I can think I'm not alone literally millions of other people in the world right this second are feeling these exact same feelings there may be different content attached um not my personal history content but um i find that a lovely practice and also if you know the practice of tonglen where you i mean it's very like crash to coach in a way it's taking in pain and suffering and and difficulty and breathing out sort of the resource that's needed and so you can do this for yourself you can do this for others and i'm just sort of saying so here's like some you know some different things and it's really i think for me i want to like bring the arts in particularly into our empathy and compassion practices to extend our sense of being really connected to other human beings in the world and in the field um so this is uh, just a beautiful, beautiful painting by an indigenous woman artist in the Northern Territories in Australia. It's really, I love this painting so much. Imagine that, that is your vision. <laughs> I mean, hold that, try that on as your vision. That is so amazing. It's so vibrant and utterly utterly beautiful um and her name is it's called my dreaming and her name is judy napangadi watson and as i say so this is another little piece of art this is, i got this off twitter <laughs> so it was a mum it was going uh me what are you drawing <laughs> the five-year-old oh just a picture about how i feel me oh i'd love to see that can i see the picture <laughs> she's so like utterly adorable but how brilliant is that for a five-year-old this is how i'm feeling <laughs> this is literally how i'm feeling uh wonderful 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 and then this is an art installation by a Mexican artist, um, Elena Chauvet. Uh, it's an installation on male violence and missing women and girls to femicide, which is the murder of females. I, I expect some of you have seen this. It's called Red Shoes. Ah. Uh, yeah. There. Um, yeah. Just pretty amazing piece of art. It's about missing women. Um, so I'm just kind of like bringing these things in. Obviously, there's so, you know, there's a, a billion things I could select from, but I'm just bringing in some things here. So then I will do all of them, actually. Uh, so then the fourth one <laughs> is communication and relationship. And what I'm particularly interested in, we've got such an amazing you know, we've got the sleight of mouth patterns, we've got this principled persuasion, we've got proper naming. I'd like us also to move more into this idea of like cognitive linguistics, 
And the, although we have deep structure, surface structure from Chomsky, he also wrote a really interesting book called The Manufacture of Consent. And I feel these are some of the things that it would be really great for us to know about. Not in a cognitive way, all of this needs to be gone through coach state, through empathy, through relationship. Um, it's not to kind of be cleverer than other people, it's to kind of deeply, deeply be holding, you know, informed knowledge and practice about how human beings get to think the things that they do and maybe what we could do about them. This is currently a huge area of research, as I'm sure you're aware of, this idea of epistemic closure, um, which is basically this. You know, I'm, I, I bet most of you have seen this. This is the American news and media outlets that people were watching during the election campaign. Who's watching what? Um, uh, the red ones are the, you know, people who voted for Trump and the Republicans, the blue one or blue ones are the more sort of Democrat, Biden, you know, then there are some mixes. But basically, we are living in different worlds. We are living in different worlds. You know, the news is being packaged and brought to us and opinions and frames. And um, I, I mean, one of the books, and I've mentioned it, I'll mention it at the end by um, George Lakoff, you know, who wrote Metaphors We Live By, which is one of a kind of classic NLP book that we often all read along the way. And, uh, NLP training and he basically says the truth will not set you free <laughs> you know that you can have all the facts at your fingertips but they aren't what really kind of shifts the frames that people are understanding and experiencing uh, what's happening through there's an art which I think is you know as I say we've got this beautiful proper naming, principle persuasion, like how can we be in an ongoing practice of research and development, finding what's out there, who's working with language, who's working with metaphors. Like I have a colleague, uh, well, he's a very dear friend actually, and he's working with, um, one of the pieces of research they did was with cognitive metaphor theory, uh, with people who are working in climate change. Like what sort of metaphors are people holding um, who are activists in the climate change movement? Um, really, really interesting. There's lots of really interesting things going on around, around cognitive processing that we could hold in a more embodied, soft, relational way so that in these situations, informally, as a citizen, as just a person, the opportunity might come up to just say something so, not to argue with someone or prove that they're wrong or anything like that, but to be able to come from a place of empathy, coach state, relationship, compassion, but be able to kind of know how our minds are being shaped and how we can use language. Um, and, and visuals as well. And then the last one, this might be, <laughs> this might be, this is really a, a newer kind of idea, but I was so really touched and moved to be part of the group that was at the, um, you know, Healing White Racism um, uh, group both, both times, because this is now, you know, already now in our field, it's kind of on the map as it were in our field as something really essential, I think, that we, we kind of need to know about. We need to know what I'm calling, you know, reality, evidence-based, social and historical, and I'm putting facts in little sort of, you know, quotes, because um, facts are con contended, you know. Um, but I do think that for us to be in the world, we want our field to be more diverse. We want to bring in people and be like really a global field. I really think that as practitioners of generative change, 
that we have an ongoing practice learning more and more about race and racism and injustice, race-based injustice, um, colonialism as well. Um, also sex and uh, reproductive injustice and, you know, the patriarchy. Uh, I mean, I've just chosen the, cl the classics, you know, race, race, sex, class, like how are people poor? What are we going to do about incredible global poverty and the kind of huge gap between rich and poor and the huge gap about resources? Um, and then climate crisis and uh, environmental degradation, which um, I know that's the right phrase because I currently have my goddaughter living with me who's an environmental scientist doing her PhD. So I asked her, what's the, what's the phrase right now for this? And I know this is sort of controversial and challenging, but it's like, how can we start somewhere? And again, this works together with the five practices. This is learning about race from coach state, you know, and in relationship so that we don't go into ideal self, we don't go into sort of shit, or if we do go into shame and guilt, you know, we can, we've got a practice to be able to hold that and be with it and metabolize information in a non-cognitive way so that we are informed across these kinds of areas. Um, this was uh, just one of the things, I know there's only 10 minutes, so I just come and uh, hopefully there'll be 10 minutes at the end. So this is something that happened in the UK. <laughs> this was part of one of our Black Lives Matters uh, great moments. And I know for some people, this would be controversial. I can only say people, the, the public have been pulling down statues in the public space uh, since the Romans. <laughs> so it's a very well-known, you know, piece of political theater and, uh, and it, and it and it represents a kind of change in, in the field. So this guy uh, was, uh, um, you know, owned people, uh, owned, you know, was a slave holder and buyer, owned human beings and made his money. This is Bristol, which is a, um, a city in the UK, which was founded on the wealth of slavery. Um, I think we should know things like that, you know. I think we should know why this, this was so brilliant. He was taken off his pillow, <laughs> rolled along the road and dumped in the harbor, which I thought was absolutely wonderful. You know, it was done incredibly well. Um, and it was a great moment of like, it was like a threshold moment. I mean, some of the backstory is there had been petitions to take this down for over, over 10, 20 years, I think. A lot of black, you know, English citizens live in Bristol. Here's this guy, you know, they have to pass him every day. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And then this wonderful woman <laughs> went and, and I can't find the photo of her standing on the plinth <laughs> like this. Jen Reed, I think her name is, and then and then um, an artist made a sculpture of her. Really turned it around within about a couple of weeks, and there she is with the sculpture of her now on this plinth. And of course, the statue's been pulled out of the river, and hopefully, it will go into a museum, and it will be part of living history that things change, and uh, what was normal and okay kind of isn't normal and okay anymore. And it, it, it's about waking us all up to, to, to making change. So um, I just met, started making a list. I'm sure all of you have wonderful, wonderful resource lists and, and, um, and suggestions <laughs> for where we could start. So I started in the UK. So here's very, very simple. If you're in the UK, Here's a good book, David Olusoga's Black and British, the, the children teenage version, which is very simple, takes you through Black British history. You know, it's an afternoon's read. There's a longer version. There's a television series from the BBC. Really a wonderful, wonderful Black historian. And it's just 
it will feed you. It will feed your soul. It will feed your spirit. Um, then this, again, not to be controversial. I mean, there's so many things you could bring in about, <laughs> you know, sexism and misogyny, of course. I mean, just terrible things happening all the time. But this is a very kind of neutral book. This is called Invisible Women and uh, exposing data bias in a world designed for men. So this is all the things, all the meds that were, you know, never tested on women, all the safety equipment that's never tested on women, you know, the car crash dummies that are never women, you know, so it's just, she's looking at everything. Um, it, it's really eye-opening just to see how much men are still the default human being in society. And of course, there's more and more and more. And then on the idea of um, class, there's a good book by this guy. I haven't read it, but I've just bought it. I was just looking for something. Who owns England? How we lost our land and how to take it back. Now, this may be all going too far for you. Please feel free to just breathe and center. You don't have to agree with any single thing that I've said. I'm just saying my piece right now, what I think would be good for us to be going out into the world as generative change people, as citizens with certain kind of basic knowledge about social justice and inequality, where it's come from, how it works, so that that just kind of metabolizes inside of us in a coach state. And so then I put something, you know, Greta Thunberg, not too small. There's a little book that you could read on climate change. I've got this little book, Rolf Dobelli, The Art of Thinking Clearly. Um, I just started, thanks to Ms. Dr. Patricia Novick, reading Claudia Rankine, Just Us, an American Conversation. What a wonderful book. Jamil Zaki, The War for Kindness, Building Empathy in a Fractured World. George Lakoff and his whole thing about facts will not set us free. Don't think of a blue elephant. So there's all of this, there's reading, there's watching movies, there's getting together, you know, and uh, studying in peer groups, um, just informing ourselves, but in this way, in a skillful, soft, coach state, relational, healing, developmental way and bringing that out in our families, with our neighbors, into the public sphere in whatever, in whatever way we are. So here, just to say the practice is working together and then your thoughts. <laughs> your thoughts, that was a lot, I know. 